this topic was developed in the United States many years ago. So because we didn't start from scratch, but there was really something to build on. And the person who developed it is here today, Professor Kate Lorick. She was director of the Stanford Patient Research Center, which actually uh, no longer exists. And this shows that Mrs. Lorick was getting wiser and wiser during her career. But she is still professor at the Stanford School of Medicine. She studied public health. And in 1979, she started to develop educational program um, using the example of arthritis and she turned this into a chronic disease health management program with licenses for more than 25 countries. So, well, we have 205 countries in the world, so this is uh, about 10%. Uh, so I'm so delighted that Professor Lorick has come here today in order to discuss with us, uh, telling uh, us more about her experience. It is really a great pleasure to have her here. You will also have a translation re uh, ready, so if you don't want to listen to her in English because you need a translation, then this is the time to wear your headset and then you will have the opportunity to choose channel one, channel one for the German translation. Uh, channel two would be the original, so you need to choose channel one in order to listen to Mrs. Lorig in, Eng in German. So it's your turn. Das muss jetzt Stufe zwei übersetzt werden. The only German I know. <laughs> I am so pleased to be with you all today. It's been a very long journey for you. It's been a very long journey for me. And I'd like to spend the next few minutes giving a little background. This comes from an American perspective. I am an American. But I also bring you information from many programs around the world. Because over the years, I've had the privilege of being able to travel and to see how this very small idea, and by the way, for those of you that are students here, Believe it or not, this was my dissertation many years ago. I'm the only person you know that is still working on their dissertation 40 years later. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit. I'm going to sit down and uh, we will continue. By the way, some of you will have questions. My email is here. Please feel free to write me. If you must write in German, I will find someone to translate. Better to write in English if you can. All right, let's start with some definitions. And why definitions? Because if we don't know what we're talking about, we don't know where we're going, and we probably won't get there. So let's define self-management. This is, a, this is a definition that comes from the American Institute of Medicine, but it's also very close to the definition of the World Health Organization. I will also tell you that the picture there, the, the painting, comes from an Aboriginal group in Australia that was doing the self-management program and did their own native art. So the painting is people looking after themselves and each other. Self-management are the tasks that individuals must undertake to live with one or more chronic condition. And these include having the confidence, and you've already heard about confidence and self-efficacy, to deal with the medical management, taking your pills, eating the right diet, doing your exercise. Role management, living and doing the things that people want to do and need to do. And finally, emotional management. In most patient 
courses are focused on medical management. And role management and emotional management are left largely unworked. Emotional management is especially important because over our years of research, we know that about 30% of people with chronic conditions are clinically depressed. And unless one deals with the depression, one will never get behavior change. And why should we care? We've already talked about this, because people spend their time outside of the healthcare system. Everyone self-manages. The issue is not self-management, it, it is rather how well self one manages and whether one has the skills to self-manage. I will not even try to pronounce health literacy in German. Uh, this comes from your national health plan. And I'm pretty sure that all of you are very well aware of this definition. I'm not going to read it. But we are going to talk a little bit about the differences and the similarities between health literacy and self-management. That health literacy is linked to literacy. Generally, that means reading. Self-management may or may not be linked to literacy. In my country, in many countries in Latin America, we have people taking self-management, doing very well, who cannot read and will never be able to read. In your country, you have many people who do not read the language that you work. I am illiterate in German. I am totally illiterate in German. Does that make me any less able to self-manage in Germany? Probably not. Health literacy is very much grounded in people having health information. Self-management, maybe not so much. We don't talk a lot about diseases. In fact, we don't talk about diseases at all. I don't care whether people know how the heart works, or the spleen works, or the gut works. What I care about is whether people have the skills to do what they need to do to have a good quality of life. And so this, again, is very, very different. The drivers of health literacy are motivation. Unfortunately, I don't know how to define motivation. The drivers of self-management are having the confidence to use the tools to self-manage. We'll talk a little bit about how that is defined in a minute. The tasks of health literacy are to make judgments. And the tasks of self-management are the medical role and emotional management. And the outcomes are to maintain or improve quality of life. The outcomes for self-management are improved health behaviors, better health status, less pain, less depression, lower blood glucose, and lower health care costs. And if you're wondering where I got the information about health literacy, it came from your national documents on health literacy. So those at least are what I see. This may not be totally accurate because I may not totally understand health literacy as you understand it. So let's not have a great huge discussion about this. Uh, it's probably not all that important, but I wanted you to at least see how I came to see the differences. How do I define confidence? I was very fortunate to work with many years with Dr. Albert Bandura, who you see pictured here. Um, Dr. Bandura unfortunately died last August. 
He was efficacious to the very end, continuing to write until the day he died. Self-efficacy is simply one's belief that they can accomplish a specific task or behavior. Yesterday morning, I had to ask myself, how confident am I that I can get from the hotel to the museum by public transportation? I started out at about a five, and then because I have pretty good digital health literacy, or digital literacy, I used the internet and figured out how to use the transport system, and I got to be an eight, and I'm happy to report that I got to the museum, and I got back, and I got an ice cream cone on the way. <laughs> Self-efficacy, we know how to change confidence. Skills mastery. If people do something, they're sure they can do it again. I feel very confident I could use the transport system again. Modeling. Seeing somebody like you doing something. I've used modeling a lot here in Berlin because I don't cross a street until other people start crossing. Reinterpreting symptoms. If people think that the reason they are tired is because of the disease, they're not going to do anything because they can't do anything about the disease. But if they understand that they can be tired because of lack of exercise or depression or poor nutrition, then they're more likely to try things. And finally, social persuasion. If everyone around them does something, then it's much more likely that other people will do it also. Thinking about coming to Germany, I thought, what should I wear? I know in Europe, people tend to wear dark colors much more than we do. Social persuasion. And therefore, I tried to plan my wardrobe to fit into where I was going. I almost made it. Why self-efficacy? Because both baseline self-efficacy and changes in self-efficacy are associated with changes in health behavior and health status. If you want to look at a causal behavioral mechanism in self-management courses that we do, it is self-efficacy. And also, it's very easy to operationalize self-efficacy in developing a program. So where does chronic disease come in? It is recommendation number 13 of your national action plan on health, on health literacy. I will talk a little bit about the intervention. You've already heard a bit. I'll talk a little bit more. This poster comes from Canada. I'm going to show you lots of things from different countries just to show you how things look different places. We have groups that are generally face-to-face. -face. However, in the last two years, we now have groups that are done virtually via the internet and also by telephone. All our programs are six weeks. They're generally two and a half hours a week, eight to 15 participants. They are very interactive. The longest lecture is about three minutes, four minutes. And they're all based on self-efficacy theory. The programs are available in English, Spanish, Chinese, German, French, and many other languages. So now I'm going to give you a little bit of the evidence. And I'll just tell you that every picture you see are real classes. Uh, this one is a class in the United States. Um, in our original randomized trial, which is now many years old, the average age was 62, about 27% were men. The number of years of education was about 14, and the number of chronic diseases was 2.2. Six months after, later in a randomized trial, this was a big trial. I tend to do large studies. Uh, this was a trial of more than 1,000 people. Uh, we saw improved health behaviors, especially exercise, communicating with health providers. We saw improved health status, self-rated health. Self-rated health is the single best predictor of future health. 
we saw less disability, better role activity, less fatigue, and less depression, and improved self-efficacy. And if you're wondering about costs, I'm going to show you those in a minute. This was the first trial. This is the same trial, the data two years after baseline. People were still showing less fatigue, less depression, more self-efficacy, and more importantly, they did not have deterioration two years later from baseline which is not something you'd expect from people with chronic disease because people tend to get worse over time. This particular picture gives you an idea of the flexibility of the program. It is being held in Jorge's garage in a Mexican-American area of San Diego, California. And why is it being held in Jorge's garage? Because that's where the people live. That's where the people feel comfortable. Now, we don't have very many programs in garages, but I think this, I show this just to show the flexibility. Um, about 10 years ago now, we had an opportunity to do a national study in the United States of, again, a little over 1,000 people. 42% of these people were underserved populations. Basically, that means that they were either poor, they had first languages other than English, were very rural. And what we saw was exactly the same thing. Communicating with health providers improved, medication adherence improved. This was the first time we'd ever looked at medication adherence. And in every study we've looked at since, adherence improves. The first study, we actually looked at health literacy. Health literacy improved and exercise improved, as did self-rated health, fatigue, depression, and pain. A third study. This was a study sponsored by Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield in the United States. It was for diabetes self-management. We had most of the people online but we had about 200 of them in person. And there were no differences in the in-person and online outcomes, and therefore we've just combined the data. Uh, it's very, the diabetes self-management program is very similar to the chronic disease self-management program, but it is, it is diabetes specific, especially in its recommendations for nutrition and a few other things. It meets all the standards of the diabetes standards for the United States. It is available in English, Spanish, and Chinese. It again is taught by peers. By the way, we had the same problem we just heard. The diabetes educators who are professionals were sure that we had come as the work of the devil. Um, they were absolutely positive that this would not work that it was dangerous, that we shouldn't do it. Uh, more and more they've accepted that maybe this is a way to do diabetes education. I am not sure, but I think we are the largest provider of diabetes education in the United States right now. That may not be true, but I think we are. And again, the programs are taught by peers. And the outcomes, um, I'm not sure what standards you use. A1C is blood glucose levels over the last three months. Anything above seven is considered high. For those people that were above nine, we saw a change of one full point. That's a big change. For everybody, we saw a change of about 0.3. We saw improved medication and lab testing adherence we also saw improved depression. So now let's look at costs. In these three studies, the original uh, um, study showed a reduction in emergency department visits and number of times hospitalized. And I'll just say all these are statistically significant. I've not put all the statistics. You don't need those. If you want them, they're published. 
In England, where there, we did a study of about 500 people for the expert patient program, the, re the report was that it was likely to be cost-effective alternative to usual care. In the diabetes self-management program I just showed you, we was the first program where we actually looked at patient data from the insurance company that was propensity matched three to one with other patients in the insurance company's files controlling for all kinds of things. And the final conclusion was that there was a reduction in health care costs with a direct savings of about 800 US dollars, which is today very similar to a euro. And finally, the latest study is a study, I'm not sure whether Germany participated in the Epicronic study or not. Does anyone know? No, all right. Epicronic was done out of Spain. I know that France had participated, England had participated, Italy had participated in Spain, and I'm just not sure if there were other countries. Again, with the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program, this comes from their final report. These data are not published yet, but their average savings per participant were about 307 euros. So you can see that the savings are more or less similar throughout the different studies. So what's happened 20 years after we started? We now have five courses. We have five, or at least five other courses. Besides the chronic disease course, we have the diabetes self-management course. There is an HIV program for people that are HIV positive, which we're probably going to retire soon, not because there's not people that are HIV positive, but thankfully HIV has now become a chronic disease and not a death sentence as it was when we started. We have a pain self-management program, which is probably our largest, quickest growing program. We have a cancer thriving and surviving program for people that have finished their initial cancer treatments. This is a very large program, especially in Ireland. And we have building better caregivers which is a program for carers of people, caring for people with Alzheimer's disease and other sorts of dementia. The program is now in 35 countries. It is initiative of the Pan American Health Organization, which is the America's region of the World Health Organization. And we think we're reaching about 75,000 people a year it's a little hard for us to have really good statistics. But I think this is probably a pretty fair number. So you all are very interested in funding. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about funding mechanisms in different countries. In Canada, the funding comes from the provincial governments. And in this time, most but not all of the provincial government, governments in Canada are supporting the program. In the United States, it is a mess. We have federal agencies, and those federal agencies, strangely enough, are not health agencies. It's funded through our aging, our, our, uh, the, 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 uh, the Administration for Community Living, which is the federal agency which funds programs for older people and people with disability. There's also a funding available through the Centers for Disease Control, which is our public health agency. Uh, we are working on getting it into more of the mainstream medical care funding, such as Medicare. That has not happened yet on the federal level, but someday, maybe. Hong Kong is a really interesting example of a private organization because in Hong Kong, the Salvation Army is the major funder. The Salvation Army also runs the major programs for seniors in Hong Kong. In Denmark, it's a partnership between government and insurance companies. In the United Kingdom, it's generally 
commissioning by the individual health trusts. In New Zealand, I think New Zealand is the only country right now, but I may be wrong, Finland I think is also the same way, that it is an initiative of the federal government through health funding. And in Latin America, through the Pan American Health Organization, uh, we're also beginning to work with WHO and hope to be able to provide programs for Ukrainian refugees in Europe. But that's really in the planning stages. It's not in fruition yet. So this gives you an idea of different funding throughout the world. I cannot advise you on funding in Germany. I don't know enough about you. Uh, I can tell you that this is kind of the way it's being done, and it changes all the time. And if any of you ever want contacts with people in other countries, please write us. We're very happy to give you contacts and to help each other. So in 2020, the pandemic happened. We very quickly moved programs to both a virtual format using Zoom or Teams or any other virtual platform. We also put together a telephone and toolkit format uh, for those people that will not use the internet, cannot use the internet, do not have access to the internet, and all of our training became virtual. So we're now training our leaders virtually, we're training our master trainers virtually. We're beginning to go back to some face-to-face -face training for leaders. This is the only study of virtual CDSMP that I know of that exists. Uh, this is a pre-test, post-test, eight-week, very quick, very dirty study. It was done in inner city Cleveland, Ohio. I'm going to show you what the people look like in this study in a minute. We sent everybody a toolkit through the postal service, which included a book, an exercise CD or a relaxa and a relaxation CD and a self-test. And by the way, the CDs, people can also get MP3s. The self-test just had people go through, answer the same sorts of questions you use on pre and post tests. They then graded it themselves and then we told them based on their score for depression or for exercise, where in the materials they might look to get help. So it was a way to kind of guide them through the materials. Then they had six weekly scripted telephone calls that were conducted by a peer leader. These are tiny groups, three to four, three to six people. It says four here, but they sometimes go to six. In this study, 80% of the people attended four sessions or more. And this is what the people look like. Now these were not the people in the study because this was taken at Fairhill Partners where the study was done before the study began. But as you see, these people all come from inner cities. Uh, almost half of them were African American. What dual eligible means that they were eligible for both of our federal government's health insurance programs. Dual eligibles are the poorest of our poor people. They had low education, they had high disability. So this was a very disadvantaged group. And what happened? They had reduced pain. They had reduced depression. And they had increased self-efficacy. And as I said, this is a taste. It's a short study. I wouldn't put national policy on this study. We are right now doing a much larger study that we will finish in September, I believe, of six-month outcomes of both the virtual and the telephone programs. And so probably about a year from now we'll have a publication, but we'll probably report the data much sooner because at least in the United States a lot of policy is depending on that. Why are these programs effective? Co-creation. We don't do anything without talking to patients, and we talk to them a lot. 
Co-creation is really key in everything we do. All of our programs have some common core dip components. Action planning, decision making, problem solving. Doesn't matter which of our programs, they have the same core components. Self-tailoring. Most health programs are tailored. Tailored means that a health professional learns something about a person and then based on what they learn, the health professional gives advice. Self-tailoring, we cannot have peers doing that. And I'm not even sure it's a good thing to do. So in our programs, they're self-tailored and that means that people discuss whatever problems they want. When they do problem solving, they pair and share, what is your problem? Let's go through the steps. What is your problem? Let's go through the steps. Decision making, the same thing. Action planning, we don't tell people what to do. They make their own decisions about what to do and report back to it. What our leaders do is they guide them through the process, but leaders never give advice. We actually fired a trainer this past week. We do fire trainers, not very often mainly because the trainer insisted on telling people what to do. And that's not part of our programs. We recognize the role of depression. And our design is always with a thought to evidence and policy. Because when I look at a program, I say, is this something that could be replicated for 100,000 or a million people a year? And if the answer is yes, it's designed for evidence and policy. If it depends on the skill of one person, no. I have a lot of training skills. I might be able to get better outcomes than the CDSMP. But most people haven't had a four-year doctoral degree in health education. And if you depended on somebody like me to do the programs, we wouldn't have very many people ever getting them. So this gives some idea of why we think the programs are effective. A little later, you'll have a chance to ask questions. At lunch, I'm happy to answer questions. And again, let me tell you how delighted I am to be with you today. Thank you. <laughs>